Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk on the fourth house. The title is Nurturance, Integration, and Family. Living with Claire in the fourth house. And Linda, I just love, love this image that you created. Holy moly. Wow. So I'll start by just pointing out that the fourth house by its nature is in polarity to the 10th house. In the 10th house, we are aware of our presence in the world. We cultivate self-responsibility, self-authority. We learn about consequences. We learn about the relative experience of appropriate, how to behave in the right way in certain experiences, certain circumstances. The fourth house relative to that basically says there's a great need within our human experience to not hold a certain level of vigilance and persistent concern with what things look like, how we're showing up, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to behave. Because the experience within the fourth house is one of full acceptance and safety to be exactly where we are right now. And what I want to do is explore this idea of safety because it's a very fascinating concept. And in general, the water archetypes, the water signs and houses all speak to the idea of safety in some way. Safety from the point of view of the fourth house speaks to, I am safe to be where I am right now, having the experience that I'm having. Because if I'm not safe, that which is delicate that which inherently needs care won't have the opportunity to actually exist. And so there's a, there's sort of this fundamental existential dilemma that we face if we don't feel safe because we have emotions. There, there are sensations arising within us that fundamentally needs a container that needs a safe space in order to be felt and experienced in order to inform our sense of self in the moment. So safety is basically the child is crying, the baby is crying. It's safe to have that experience. It knows that there's a container that allows for its full experience of the moment. Safety is, oh, safety says, I wake up in the morning and I'm having a particular emotional experience where I'm feeling a fear about the day or I'm holding a memory of something that happened yesterday. But right now, I don't have to do anything. Right now, I don't have to call this person or I don't have to get up yet right now. I get to take my time. I get to nurture my experience. And again, that polarity to the fourth house, the 10th house really reflects this dynamic wherein consciousness is needing to integrate between the fact of its presence in the world, having various responsibilities and roles that are manifesting within time and space and the fact that it also has to be in a very clear and conscious relationship to its present moment human experience. Safety can be taken to this extreme where there is such an identification with needing to feel safe that there's actually a fear of leaving metaphorically or literally leaving the home, leaving the bed. And so there's this interesting growth process that occurs in the fourth house where on the one hand, there needs to be some level of continuity and consistency that's provided from outside of ourselves. meaning we need to depend on a certain level of care and nurturance to be available for us in our life. There needs to be something that we can depend upon so we don't have to um, hold that for ourselves all the time. And again, this is exampled in the fact of a child or a baby. And on that level of the life caring for us, life nurturing us, it allows us to grow up and sort of develop a healthy ego, a healthy sense of self. I can have my experience, I can have my emotions, I can have my attachments, I can have my fears, and it's okay. Life isn't telling me to grow up and get over it. I'm safe to have the experience that I'm having. That's one dimension of the fourth house. But there's a maturation that occurs. And this is where I really resonate. And I think I got this from Adam Gainsburg, where 
the fourth house lunar cancer archetype, in a sense, speaks to where we have one foot on the on the shores and the sands of the known, and one foot in the waters of emotion of the unknown, really. New moment, new experience. I've never been here before. I don't know myself here. It's water. It's intangible. It's a new experience. I can't grasp. It's not concrete. So in this other dimension of cancer, we are learning about ourselves, And I deeply resonate with the idea that the fourth house corresponds to how we cultivate self-intimacy along the soul journey. Because on this level of understanding the fourth house, there's a need for us to know how to be intimate, how to be present with, with the intricacies of our human experience, with the emotions that are manifesting right now, what, with what's actually present in a way that we're able to integrate it. Right? And a baby doesn't have that capacity and it shouldn't have that capacity. It, it's we're programmed on this evolutionary journey to come into this world absolutely dependent on being cared for. And of course, that's where the fourth house on that first level of where we are dependent on the outer reality simply reflects the nurturing environment that we come into, meaning it's our emotional imprinting. It's how life has cared for us or not cared for us in that sense. But as we mature, we really learn how to hold that relationship to this tender, delicate space inside of ourself. And this is fundamentally because we are not our emotions, meaning there's this profound wisdom and truth in the fourth house uh, evolutionary arc, where we learn how to be in relationship to what arises because we are not that which arises. And so in a sense, we learn how to parent ourselves. We learn how to nurture and care for the present moment. And, and that nurturing and caring for the present moment means we learn how to hold the baby. Now the baby's inside of us. We learn how to be responsive to what's arising now. And so the journey of the fourth house is the cultivation of emotional intelligence, emotional intimacy, emotional attunement, emotional presence. And the capacity to attend to what's arising within oneself is a profound, profound thing. Of course, within patriarchal society, there tends to be, in general, a lack of appreciation for the yin, a lack of appreciation for the importance of being in relationship to that which is tender and delicate, and the importance of developing that quality of intelligence to the emotional body. But one of the great teachings of the fourth house and the moon and cancer, and really this is sort of the foundation of EA in general, is evolution is integrated through the emotional body. And what that means is through relationship to what's happening emotionally in the moment and our ability to attend to it, it allows us to integrate our experiences. Thus, it allows us to settle into a solid sense of self. That's what it's all about. We need to have a clear sense of self. So let's talk about that for a moment. There's no clear or objective... Uh, to speak objectively, the, se the sense of self is just a sense, meaning the soul, who we truly are, is projecting an image of self. And that image of self is not objectively true, right? It's a vehicle. It's how we're imagining ourselves, And that's, this allows us to be in interface to our external reality. It's what allows us to take in experience and integrate and filter it but when experience is happening or there are emotional imprints manifesting through our relationship to our world experience, someone looked at us a certain way or said something and it's registering inside, you know, what is this doing? It's like, I don't know who I am in relation to this, but my sense of self, it, it doesn't have a ground here. And that's where insecurity comes in. A uh, self-concept needs to feel welcomed. Self-concept needs to feel safe. Self-concept needs to feel like it can open up. And this is all just a very fascinating part of this soul journey because it's very fluid. It's shifting. The self-image, the self-concept is an image. It's a concept. And yet at the same time, we don't transcend it. 
we accommodate to it. We open ourselves to it. We, we become available and work with respect to it in the same way that if you, I often give this example. I mean, this is, this is an obvious thing. I give examples with dogs, but you can give this example with humans. And that's the point. If you meet a dog and that dog is barking at you because it has some sort of imprint of, you know, human being with goatees are scary. The way to create safety for that dog and that's it's irrational, right? It's 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 a projection of life experience that reflects its own sense of where safety is, what it's come to know. But you don't you don't objectively, rationally, or intellectually work with that. You have to work with it emotionally. We must accommodate ourselves and make ourselves available to actually shape our behavior around the ego construct. That's a fascinating thing about this whole ego experience, this whole sense of self, we have to be respectful of it. And so to create safety for that dog, we have to work with its construct, its ego. We can't force safety. So it might be walking towards that dog, not looking at it, not being too confrontational, but just creating a sense of I'm going to be in the room and imprint the experience of my presence equals safety. And so self-image, self-concept is able to include, oh, in my very subjective and limited filter of reality, this human being type experience that I'm having with this person is okay. And then you can sit down next to this dog and just sort of be next to them. And there's a feeling of, oh, I'm safe here. And that acclimates a sense of familiarity. This is what happens for all of us we learn to emotionally integrate and open to and connect with gradually, progressively through our own journey, a sense of I can be myself here. I can be open. And what does a dog do? This is a great example. Babies do this too. They want to know that mommy and daddy is close by, or they want to know that their, their imprint of emotional nurturance, that which they depend upon for security and safety is close by, while they're individuating. You know, my daughter will love, she walks a lot now, so she'll walk all over the place um, and will explore. But you can tell if she realizes, I don't know where mommy or daddy is. That's scary because security and safety still predominantly depends upon these external forms of nourishment. So as we grow, the journey within the fourth house is learning how to maintain a, a necessary level of continuity and security for all of ourselves so that we have a way of emotionally integrating our experiences, right? If she hurts herself, she's going to cry and need to be picked up. If we feel hurt, if there's something that arises in our field that is uncomfortable to our sense of self, we need to be able to fall back on some form, some source of nourishing, of nurturance and care. And so the second dimension of the fourth house is as we learn self-intimacy, there is a necessary relationship in connecting with the archetype of vulnerability and tenderness. And if we push ourselves too far, if we don't allow ourselves to be tender and to have needs, to feel dependent, we'll kind of threaten our ego, we'll threaten our sense of security, and that almost creates unresolved emotional needs. So we have this dynamic in the fourth house, very, very often, where at a certain point in our life, there's a need to reconnect to basic uh, emotional imprinting, emotional nurturing that we never really received. Returning to the parts of ourselves that are tender, and it's not rational then it shouldn't be judged because the fourth house speaks to if we're not going to meet what is inside of ourself, if we're not going to meet the parts of ourselves that need to feel loved and cared for, that need permission, we will never feel integrated and whole within our own being. But then as we grow, there's that need to say, okay, I'm going to consciously in this moment look towards what is needing care and permission. And that's where that, four, that that tenth house polarity is so important. You know, whatever's in the fourth house, 
it's we're needing to understand that we can nurture ourselves, we can take care of ourselves. And that in time, 10th house, if we practice, if we show up consistently, we're going to build our skills, we're going to build, build our capacity to responsibly self care. And this is where the fourth house is about family. It's about nurturing, it's about integration. It's about family because as we grow along our journey, we realize I always need to feel rooted in family. It's, it's always true. It's not just true when you're a baby and you need your family, you need your parents. The archetype of family says, where are my roots? Where can I fall back? Where can I rest? Where can I be held? Where can I be nurtured? And the energy of family can manifest for all of us in very different ways. It can be biological, it can be friends, it can manifest in so many different ways. But as we root in the experience of family or in the experience of home and being home, there's that sense that right here in this environment, in this context with these people, I can let go. I don't need to be vigilant. I'm allowed to feel safe. I'm allowed to nurture. Traditionally, we think of the fourth house more in external terms. It's like family and nurturing and our tribe and belonging. And so we often might miss the, the evolutionary aspect to it where there is a very real growth edge for all souls on their journey in being able to access and root more deeply and more fully in a sense of I am at home. Our relationship to being at home is so fundamental. We, we can have souls that are very awake, very evolved, but their fourth house dynamics can easily express as, well, they never really allowed themselves. They never deeply explored emotional vulnerability. And this is where a part of the soul journey, and this will be different for every single soul through the fourth house, will take a soul on a journey of family and home and dependencies and learning the importance of healthy dependencies, healthy attachments. It's not about transcending these attachments. It's about being able to integrate our emotions via the attachments. And then there's no longer a need to depend entirely on these external sources to the same extent. Further, we begin to learn the importance of providing for others. We become a source of nurturance for others in realizing I can create safety and nurturance by way of really having empathy and care for this collective human condition that we're all sharing. Everyone needs to feel at home. Everyone needs to feel cared for. And in fact, in this perfect journey of oneness, our own family, our own children, or those that we are caring for, any, any dimension of our life that shows up in a fourth house kind of way, where in the fourth house we are caring for nurturing other beings, could be even pets, it's going to reflect the parts of ourself that need care as well. So this is where through family, through relationship, oh, computer just almost fell. Where through relationship, we will continue this journey of emotional integration. And there are two dimensions I want to speak to in the fourth house. One is the square to Libra, and one is the square to Aries. In being able to express one's emotions, be it crying or just the need to have a particular emotional experience and to be held in that experience. In the same way that a baby is dependent on others, in the way we can see that's the square between Libra and Cancer. Libra being relationship. Cancer is there's an expectant here. I'm expecting that my parents will care for me. Now, as we grow, we learn how to navigate our relationships, but through Libra, through communication. Right? We ask our needs, we communicate needs, then we form healthy agreements or expectations where we're understanding how we can be caring and nurturing to one another. So the square between Libra and Cancer on one level is through relationship, we feel unconditionally accepted for who we are. Cancer, Libra, which means we can let go. 
right? We can just connect to that sense of vulnerability and tenderness and feel like we're going to be held by others. The challenge between the Cancer Libra dynamic is that sense of displaced emotions being put onto other people needing to be cared for, right? So this sort of reflects that maturation process. Relationships provide for us this forum through which we will learn how to take responsibility, Capricorn polarity, for our own emotional needs by way of learning how to communicate that so that our relationships really nurture the cultivation of family in our lives. But that's the thing. It's like it's expected and it comes with the territory when you're a baby, when you're a child, hopefully. But as an adult, th there's almost a need to know how to work with that consciously to communicate it so that relationships are formed in a way that nurtures that. Likewise, the Cancer Aries polarity, which then reflects in, archetypally the first house, fourth house, on the one hand, we need to be able to completely emote. First house, raw energy, Aries, raw energy, you know, like a child screaming its head off. We need to be able to have emotion, emotion, which is just pure energy. On the one hand, this can reflect the immaturity of a child that isn't aware of how is this affecting other people? Am I in a lecture? Am I in school? Are other people it's just going to cry? It's going to have its experience. It hasn't become aware of its environment. And so there is that need to be able to access that at the same time as the soul grows. There's also this awareness of I can't just act like a child. Next again, that the Capricorn Aries square, you know, completing this cardinal cross. And in society, there are ways to act in this world that are appropriate or inappropriate, relatively speaking, in the moment. So working with that Aries Libra square to cancer really reveals a lot of how that fourth house functions because we need to be able to fully release Aries. And there also needs to be a sense of safety and permission from others so that we can feel held and okay to do that at the same time. So in the fourth house, this is such a powerful journey of navigating and learning how to parent ourselves so that we can fully have our experience, fully connect with the interior of our life experience without living in this emotional reactivity place or constantly needing permission from the external world to give it to us. And again, this is why I fundamentally think of fourth house as self-intimacy. We don't often think of that phrase, self-intimacy with a fourth house. And I think Jeffrey Wolf Green has spoken to the fourth house as self-intimacy. Maybe Linda, you can, you can tell me if that's true or not. But the reason why that really resonates for me is because at the end of the day, the self that we're looking at here is a relationship between who we fundamentally are, which is eternal and whole and sovereign and strong. That's sort of the soul. That's maybe the Scorpio Pluto dimension, our eternal being, having this human experience. And in a sense, the fourth house reflects a limitation of this human experience. We all come into this life as a baby. And so our evolutionary journey is only going to happen as quickly as we are able to integrate our present moment emotions. And that's why that intimacy with self is so fundamental, so necessary. So I want to share one little example. I, when I tune into um, charts, I just kind of, when I tune into the example, I just randomly let the mind go where it goes. And I thought of uh, two people, Brad Pitt and Justin Bieber. And I think it's funny because Brad Pitt's first sort of critical acclaim to fame was he was a solo hitchhiker in the movie Thelma and Louise. So you can just see that solo hitchhiker. He has uh, Jupiter and Aries in the fourth house. People's, people's film roles are lucidly a reflection of their own karmics. It's fascinating how souls will kind of, in, in a way, process their own soul dynamics through the roles that they play. I think it's really interesting um, that Jupiter and Aries in the fourth square to the nodal axis, including Mars and Capricorn in the first, it really brings that imagery of a rugged, you know, solo journeyer, home on the road, walking alone, right? Um, 
you know, respect, respecting the soul's journey and, and just sort of this, the, um, the nature of this soul path. I do want, I do just want to point out some core themes. Obviously we have uh, an importance here around working with a, a desire for roots and grounding moon ruling that North node cancer conjunct Venus and Capricorn in the second, there's a grounding there and Pisces on the fourth house ruled by Neptune. So archetypally speaking, I'm not going to speak directly to the soul, but archetypally speaking, Pisces in the fourth house, what's that process of coming home, of emotional integration, of really cultivating roots and ground? Pisces, through spiritualizing the emotional body, connecting with a transcendent understanding of oneself in universal and spiritual terms. Home must be linked to a universal concept, something that is beyond just me. And so there's a cultivation of empathy and compassion for the universality of all of our experiences, that we are all, in a sense, brothers and sisters. We are all children of the one. And there is a healing in being able to recognize and come into a place of, 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 of being a conduit, being a vessel for this quality of universal nurturing, universal caring. And we know that in his, like, all of this is public, Neptune in the 11th house, humanitarian, he adopted uh, with Angelina Jolie several children um, from other communities in other parts of the world, right? More disenfranchised parts of the communities, subcultures, 11th house, basically, uh, an expression of this universal compassion for all people from all walks of life, 11th house being all kinds of people, Neptune, indiscriminate. And so that reflects a part of his own soul journey and coming home, reflecting really the, the deeper truth of his own spirituality at home must be a universal thing where we're all welcomed, we're all cared for. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. So yeah, that's just a meaningful thing to point out too. When you have planets in the fourth house, squaring the nodal axis, that's going to speak to, and in general, not always, because houses can be any size. In general, that planet in the fourth house, square in the node, is going to speak to where there is a crisis in self-image. And so there are going to be core fundamental emotional needs that the soul is going to need to face, which means a process of self-parenting, self-loving, caring. And usually if it's a seventh house, first house dynamic, it's going to speak a lot to issues around abandonment, loss of basic needs for care, relationships where needs can be processed, met, and shared, but also the need to cultivate self-intimacy. The resolution node usually being in the first house, where there's going to be a need to connect with one's internal emotional reality in a way where they are facing it, being willing to actually meet their own selves, meet themselves, and not necessarily depend on defining themselves according to what others will give to me, what others will provide. But in the same sense, relationships will, will really bring up all of those places. So that, that fluctuation between I'm going to go it alone, but then having these deep loneliness dynamics inside. And then getting into a relationship and finding that there is a deep, deep needs for care and connection that aren't being met or a level of tenderness and expectation or projection that's manifesting that other people simply cannot provide. So there are, are deep lessons when a soul is working with that fourth house dynamic. And while I'm on the topic, when you have the nodal axis manifesting in the fourth house, so it's going to be in the fourth, 10th axis, we're speaking to a soul journey where the evolutionary theme really strongly constellates around knowing oneself within the relative human experience. So who am I? What makes me feel safe? Where's my family? Where are my roots? Where can I grow? And if that's healthy, if there's a strong sense of I can feel whole within myself, then there's the ability to enter into that 10th house Capricornian realm without a lot of insecurity. Or if there's insecurity, there's the capacity to say, I know that I'm loved and I'm cared for. So oftentimes that nodal axis can reflect a crisis, a tension between the work that one is to do in the world, showing up in society, fulfilling one's social work, social purpose, with a deep need to work out 
core self-image issues. When there is insecurity, you can't fake it. You can't fake security. And it's going to come up one way or another. And again, it's one of those things in life where there is not, in my opinion, adequate respect and appreciation in, in culture in general. And this is changing big time, of course, at this day and age, which is great. But historically, there really hasn't been a lot of appreciation for the profundity of the fourth house archetype and what it represents in consciousness, the importance of insecurity, the importance of learning how to have a relationship to the internal emotional landscape that says, this is important, this is valid, that there is a skill set that we learn in being present with what arises in a way where we can integrate it. You know, babies cry, they're held, they feel, they move on. And if that's denied, they can't really develop a clear sense of self. You know, the ability to integrate and meet our emotions means we can have our experience and then move on. And it's just beautiful. To me, self-intimacy is being able to hold space for it, but not subduing our emotions by just feeding ourselves with candy or sugar. Because a, a dynamic within the fourth house can be how we emotionally distract ourselves from actual self-intimacy. It can be through other people, that seventh house square. It can be through strong identification with the emotions and thus sort of being reckless with it, uncontrolled, not contained, not holding a space for it. Because fourth house needs a container. The parental reality is holding that. Tenth house, there's a container for the baby to have its experience. It's going to be protected so we can do that. There needs to be that ability to hold oneself in that space where everything can arise. Otherwise, within the fourth house, there can be an emotion and oh, I'm just going to move towards whatever's comfortable, right? Eating, um, filling myself up with whatever is distracting for me, with whatever is uncomfortable for, you know, whatever takes me away from my discomfort. So I don't actually have to feel. And this is where a big, what would be the right word? Self-avoidance is an accurate phrase that I would describe for the fourth house. Self-avoidance, self-distraction. Uh, uh, one expression of that would be turning towards ways of looking outside of oneself to numb or satisfy one sense of discomfort without actually facing the fullness of one's present moment experience. And again, this can be with food. It can also be by focusing on external nurturing. It's like, I'm going to focus on caring for others. I'm going to hold the baby. I'm going to try to take care of other beings because that, that quality in the fourth house, if we're making other people feel safe, that sort of vicariously makes us feel safe and cared for without necessarily actually looking at our own self, right? If I could have, um, you know, let me hold more babies. Let me feed you. Let me take care of more people. Oh, let me nurture you. But it's like that fourth house is we can easily live in that consciousness where we're not actually facing ourselves. Right? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Right? How am I feeling? What's actually here in me? There can be that mechanism of, you know, so a soul that are strongly, a strong fourth house oriented can really express in one way or another, sort of not necessarily having a connection to the family nurturing principle or indulging in it as a way of sort of running from oneself which is interesting. In a sense, giving and caring for other people can be such a profound way of finding love and care and nurturance within oneself. Feeding people a meal, giving someone a massage, it's a way of saying, oh my God, I can make another person feel loved and cared for. This must say that I am also whole, right? If a person can feel loved and cared for and safe in my presence, that must say that I'm safe. It really is a profound growing experience. This is on a healthy note, to have that experience of caring for and providing for another. And as long as that doesn't become a way of avoiding oneself, 
it's a natural part of the growth within the fourth house experience to realize that we can nurture and care for one another. We can live in this way of tribalism in the sense of here we are, we all need to be loved, we all need touch, we all need care, we all need to be fed, we all want warmth. You know, second house is food, water, shelter. Fourth house is connection. It's not just straight up survival, it's the energetic of home within these walls. It really has nothing to do with a physical home. It has to do with the energetic experience of connecting with the space where we, where we are caring for each other. So you know, I'll just end this part of the talk on this final note, which is family is so important. And as a Sagittarius in the fourth house, of course, Sagittarius speaking to restlessness and movement where family can easily be, um, I don't want to get stuck here or the grass is always greener. I think I've talked about this on some level, maybe 20% of all videos I've ever made. It's been referenced. I won't go too far into it. Um, there is for me this profound learning and appreciation for the depth of spirituality and insight and growth and healing that comes through seeing the gifts that arise in just caring for one another. And the kind of mindset where just being attuned to the present moment would a nice warm cup of tea feel good? Would, would physically feeling more warm with some touch with being held be nice right now? Being able to attune to that for others, if I'm with my family, if I'm with a client, right? Just being able to attune to that for another, like what's this present moment need? And not just staying in the Sagittarius, go, go, go. Connecting to the moment and thus bringing insight, expanding the potential for care and warmth and love here now and seeing my own life as that. How can I deepen my experience of family? I think I had a dream where I was told, radical nurturance, nurturing, radical nurturing, radical nutrient, nutrients. Just this idea of like, how can there be more nurturing? One quality in the fourth house is rest. You know, sleeping, you can say is Pisces, 12th house, right? But also restfulness is fourth house, cancer. When my daughter gets a good nap, she is healthy. It's a very real cancer for a thousand thing. It's like, you can tell she is positive. She is clear. She's alert. She's curious. We know this when children are tired, they're cranky. Life is less safe, less exciting. Everything's wrong. Everything's bad. When you're rested emotionally, there's a part of us that gets to drop in. When we physically feel rested, there's a sense of, oh, wow, I can be here. How do you rest? How does one rest? It's not just a Taurus thing. We can say on one, on one level, resting could be Taurus second house because it's very, it does speak to basic survival and basic well-being. But it's fundamentally fourth house when I feel into it because to rest, we need to feel safe, right? How do children fall asleep? How do babies fall asleep? <laughs> They're held. Initially, you're, you need to be held to, to rest, to, to come into a place of full relaxation, full letting go. So restfulness happens in a container of knowing we have a permission to let go, of knowing that we have a permission to just drop into a deeper field of beingness. And so that might mean your room, your bedroom, or wherever you fall asleep is a place where it, it invites quiet. It invites a sense of peacefulness. It invites and provides a sense of familiarity and safety and privacy in the sense of I'm contained here. For me with Sagittarius in the fourth house, I have Jupiter in Sagittarius in the fourth house conjunct Mercury and Neptune in Sagittarius in the fourth. So I tend to have difficulty. I've had difficulty my whole life sleeping in beds. And I believe it's because on a soul level, I'm karmically very familiar with sleeping in all different kinds of places, being on the move. So I fall asleep very well and very restfully outside by the river, even on rocks, even on strange surfaces, spaces that are spontaneous and unintentional, where I'm just in a wild open space. I tend to just relax more deeply there. And so part of my own 
uh, journey with restfulness is synonymous with my own journey of living authentically in my own way, right? Finding a way of rest, um, of living where I'm being true to my own rhythms, kind of like an animal just needs to be wild and free. There's a way of living in that way where the journey feels open and fluid for me. And so, you know, sleeping on a bed high up has always been a little bit hard for me. I'm simultaneously working on on this other Sagittarius dimension, which is don't don't hold too many beliefs about it. <laughs> but th there's there's a sense of, oh, when I'm low to the ground, that feels really good. And so our home, the environment in which we actually sleep and rest is so, so important to come into a place of wholeness and restfulness. And that's how we raise our family, what our kitchen looks like, how we create it, how we create a space of nurturing. You know, as I have a family, I've been bringing out this aspect of myself that loves cooking. I mean, Sag in the fourth house. Um, I'm wild. I don't know what I'm doing until I've done it. Never do the same thing twice. It's spontaneous. I don't like to know what I'm doing until it's done. And there's also this sense of making big portions, Sag. Like it's sort of natural for me to feed a whole tribe. And I love bringing that quality out because that's a sign of me being myself. And so we all find our own way. If you have Aquarius in the fourth house, that means home and community is one. It means being with friends. It means also there is no conditioned construct that defines or predetermines what home is supposed to look like. It also speaks to emotional liberation where there might be healing around emotional imprinting that said, you are not accepted and loved and welcomed as you are, right? If you have Aries in the fourth house, there might be a need to process early imprinting around violence, violent emotional dynamics that have occurred in the early life or Capricorn in the fourth house, or Saturn in the fourth house, there might be emotional repression. So a soul might orient towards, well, this is, you know, I need a dinner at this time of day, and it has to look this way. And But it's sort of freezing the emotional body because there's actual intimacy that needs to be cultivated. There's something to access, and the soul isn't access accessing that by way of holding onto these fixed structures that it knows as safe and secure, but there's something repressed underneath that, that it needs to soft connect with. You know, whatever's happening in the fourth house really speaks to both dynamics around our early emotional imprinting and at the same time our healing, how we're coming home to ourselves and thus throughout our life, shaping a more deeply relevant, more full, authentic and intimate and true to ourself experience of being at home here in human life experience. And this will reflect in how we rest and how we care for family and how we are cared for by family and being rested, being well nourished, being cared for are all signs of healthy integration within the fourth house. So I see there are a couple comments here. Um, I found a quote of yours on the EA message board. I can put it up on the, yeah, please do Linda. That'd be wonderful. And while Linda is doing that, I'll open up to any questions from here or from Facebook? Holy moly, this is a big quote. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read it with a British accent. If we grew up in an environment in which we, it's not British accent, I actually can't do accents. So just let me do it in whatever accent I do. <laughs> if we grew up in an environment in which we experience certain comforts, certain smells, certain foods, etc. When we find ourselves in a foreign environment, we may naturally feel insecure and out of place. To maintain security, we will constantly project what we know upon what we don't know. A perfect, okay, that doesn't feel right. A perfect example would be a child that feels homesick when she sleeps over her friend's house. She misses her no, home. She knows herself, so I'm referencing here the south node of the moon in a certain way. Therefore, her self-image is one of the past, and she is carrying that with her in every moment. You know, the south node of the moon is such because it relates to the moon, relates to cancer. This is the image of ourselves that we have based upon how we've come to know ourselves. What home has come to be and feel like is where we know ourselves to be. When she is fed dinner by her friend's mother, she will filter the experience being fed by her friend's mother through our own emotional projection of what being fed by a mother is really supposed to feel like. 
I remember eating cereal at my friend's house when I was a child. In my home, we had skim milk. My mother was heavier and we had skim milk. To me, that was home. My friend whose mother was a lot, much more slend, slimmer, a slender, and they had whole milk. So a, a, a thin mother and whole milk did not feel like home for me. It felt very uncomfortable. I remember that experience, feeling very awkward there. Uh, she may therefore feel insecure when her friend's mother doesn't do it the same way her own mother does it. It is a complete shock to this child who has come to know herself in a very particular way. Luckily, she has a teddy bear with her, which she recently got as a gift from her mother. In this analogy, I, I describe the teddy bear as the moon, meaning the moon is the moment-to-moment -moment point of emotional integration. It's really how the soul is integrating each experience as it's on this evolutionary journey, which is constantly a new moment, a new experience. So it's how we're integrating constant reality of change. This teddy bear that she takes with her wherever she goes helps ease the transition from the known to the unknown. The teddy bear will help this girl develop self-intimacy, there's that word, and inner feelings of security wherever she goes. In this example, the south node of the moon is symbolized by the home this girl comes from. The moon is symbolized by the teddy bear. Great, that's a good teaching. Again, I am, I am still curious to know where I, if I invented the correlation with self-intimacy or if it's a thing Jeff Green has taught. I'm very curious if there's um, any quote from Jeff Green around that. So anyway, I'm open to any questions. And I also want to say I've come to realize it was me. Okay. I've come to realize um, through doing these for many years that I actually want to start to move away from looking at people's charts. Almost every time I've looked at charts at, in these sort of live classes, I've I've ended with a sensation of incomplete. Maybe it always hasn't felt that way for the individual. Maybe it has. But what I realize is the container, and this is a fourth house cancer thing, the container of really creating a space where there can be a full respect and appreciation for the tenderness and the truth of our personal experience of this journey is really, really important. Um, and I just want to honor the way that feels and just start to really exercise a little more discernment and, and clearer boundaries around actually looking at charts in this live container. I think it's very important. I think often it's easily a point missed uh, and underappreciated when we're teaching astrology. It's such an intimate thing. Our charts are so profoundly intimate. So I'm open to questions. And these can be questions about anything that I've been teaching or anything fourth house related. Are there any questions here, Linda? Not yet, but we may okay. get them. I'll let you know. Well, then that's it. Well, I have nothing else to say. So then we will close the class here. Okay. Thank you so much, Ari. Fantastic. See yeah. you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.